Okay, this video is about a book review of this book right here, Nutritional Oncology. And basically, I was just reviewing biochemistry cancer, and so I, I bought this book, and there's a couple interesting things about it. Um, it came out in 2022, so it's pretty recent. I thought it's a great title, Nutritional Oncology. There might be some really good stuff in here. Um, it comes indirectly related to Michael Milken. He was a superstar of the you know stock market he figured out a new way to invest and made billions of dollars and then he got prostate cancer when he was only 46 and now he's alive 30 years later at 76 years of age and they were told him at the time of diagnosis he probably only lived two years two and a half years uh so what did he do um he went and it said according to one article that he only eats fruits and vegetables i don't know if that's exactly the whole story he did also get some radiation therapy and some androgen deprivation therapy um, I saw a picture of him. He looked pretty good. He kind of looked skinny. Um, he looked like a young version of Peter Boyle, the guy who was uh, young Frankenstein in the movie. Uh, but he looked good. He looked pretty fit in the pictures I saw of him, you know, which were pretty recent. Um, and so I think that's the big thing going on the plant-based diet. What do I think of the book? Too many cooks spoil the batter. I mean, there's like one, two, three editors. That by itself is not so bad, but there's like a lot of different authors for each chapter. I can tell you, I don't know if I've ever in my life read a good book that has more than three authors. Um, usually one author is best. Oscar Wilde had said it too, that you need unity of theme and style, and that's what you get with one author. And two authors can often be great. And usually it'll be one person who's like a brilliant expert, and the other person just is more in the habit of being a writer, and those books are great. But when you get, you know, a bunch of authors, they're all going in their own direction. And most of the time, a lot of them are just trying to get another something on their resume. They don't, you know, a single author looking back on something puts it all together. Those are the best books by far. Like T. Colin Campbell writing China Study, you know, for example. Um, so was anything good about it? When I go through a book like this, what I do, I'll show you what I do. I put post-its. Uh, wherever I see something a little bit interesting, then I go back to the book and I go back to those spots. So what did I get out of this book that I thought might be of some benefit to you? Well, first of all, too, the book calls itself Nutritional Oncology. And then it seemed to, you know, I'm not even going to get into its recommendations. I don't think it's it comes down strong like you have to, like T. Colin Campbell. No animal products. None. Not a zero. Um, okay interesting things people don't necessarily know the book claims that po vitamin c after 200 milligrams per day you don't increase your plasma levels and that's is used as a rationale why some people recommend giving it iv what is the benefit of intravenous vitamin c i don't know i'm, I'm not going to get into that but i just thought that was interesting and what's the truth about how much vitamin c you should take i don't know i don't take any i just try to eat a lot of fruits um 90 of cancer death is from metastases so metastases is a you know, the advanced days of cancer when it spread to other distant locations from the original primary tumor. Um, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, EMT, is described as a way in which the, the cancer cell becomes more primitive, like a mesenchymal cell. Dedifferentiation, and it can have more of a stem cell-like behavior um, rather than just being a regular somatic cell. Uh, stem cell is more resistant to dying, harder to kill. Uh, when tumor is metastatic, it often has more variety of mutations. That's called being heterogeneous, and it's more difficult to treat. For example, if the cancer has 10 different ways to sort of grow, if you will, it's going to be hard to block that with three different drugs. So what I've seen a lot of, and I don't know if I briefly mentioned this, is that people who've done fantastic going completely low-fat, plants only, no processed food, you know, raw food, fruits and vegetables, etc., that if they go off that diet, they often crash and burn kind of rapidly and they can't get better. So it's like if you've been lucky enough to get yourself into remission through optimizing your healthy diet and lifestyle, etc., then stick with it. Don't ever leave it. Because I think what happens, again, is the cancer cell, instead of just having one receptor for, let's say, insulin-like growth factor, it can have a whole bunch of them. And all these receptors will be hypersensitive. They get a little bit of that. Um, animal protein and they could really accelerate their growth. Um, that's a common pattern. Uh, let's see, what else was interesting? They talk about the reversal of Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle, which is also called tricarboxylic acid cycle or the citric acid cycle. That's what comes after glycolysis. 
and cancer reverses it. Instead of making it a, a breakdown cycle, they turn it around backwards and make it a synthesis cycle to produce more uh, precursors for cell replication. That's kind of an interesting thing. I'm, gonna stu I'm in the process of studying that in more detail. I'll talk about that in a future lecture. Um, there's a new topic in cancer biochemistry called reverse Warburg effect. It's not yet clear how significant that is. It's a topic for a future lecture, but it's interesting. Oh, what did I see as problems with this book? You go to the, you know, this is Guy Milken, okay? Like the, one of the most famous people who ever lived that has prostate cancer. In the back of the book, in the index, there's no mention of the Ornish study. That's ridiculous, okay? I mean, how could you not mention the Ornish study, the Dean Ornish study on prostate cancer? It's like the most important one with regard to diet and uh, prostate cancer, and it's not even in the book, okay? Um, there's only two paragraphs on the Warburg effect or the Warburg effect. You know, if you're going to write a book about nutrition, that should be like the main thing, um, the prose was kind of convoluted. I was kind of hoping this would be a good reference. I could look up a bunch of stuff. There were a couple of things in here that were good and were helpful, so I, I found that value. But it was not like a go-to book. This is the book. It was sort of, you know, something another academic researcher might look at. And T. Colin Campbell had said it before. He says, the biggest problem in nutrition research is too much emphasis on reductionism. And that's a little bit of what this book was. Too much reductionism. You know, the single isolated element, green tea or lycopene or something. I'm not a big believer in that. I'm more, I, I see things pretty similar to T. Colin Campbell. You know, eat a whole food, plant-based diet, no processed food. Um, I think that's the beginning of a healthy approach to optimizing one's health for anyone, but especially if you've got cancer. Um, other things that come up sometimes, obesity is a major risk factor for cancer. A lot of things tend to be going bad when somebody's fat. They tend to have high blood lipids, hyperlipidemia. That's associated with insulin resistance. Insulin resistance leads to elevated insulin. That's called hyperinsulinemia. Insulin is a mitogen, meaning that it causes cells to divide. It's associated with increased insulin-like growth factor type 1. That also causes cells to grow and divide. You don't want uh, things are causing cells to grow and divide when you've got cancer. Okay, They're accelerating the cancer growth. Um, it's associated with elevated estrogen levels. The fat can make um, estrogen with aromatase enzyme. It's all bad. Cancer can be associated with some infections. Of course, hepatitis B, hepatitis C in the liver, H. pylori, helicobacter pylori in the stomach with gastric carcinoma, HPV with cervical carcinoma, that's human papilloma virus. Um, how does it do it? It can have some direct effect on the DNA of the target cell, but it could also be like we spoke about in the past when you have an infectious related inflammation causing scarring around normal cells, they can then become. Uh, partially deprived of oxygen and that deprivation of oxygen, you know, like let's say beyond 35% can cause the Warburg effect where the cell can't undergo oxygen, oxygen metabolism with its mitochondria and it goes into anaerobic metabolism primarily through glycolysis. That's to transform into malignancy. So that concept of hypoxia is super useful and that's called the uh, metabolic theory of cancer. So all of that stuff we'll talk about in another at another time, but what I'm kind of doing with these lectures is setting the foundations in place for persons who actually want to understand biochemistry of cancer more. To me, that's interesting. You know, um, Many cancers have pre-malignant lesions like colon adenoma polyps, breast ductal car carcinoma in situ, uh, you know, Barrett's esophagus with esophageal cancer from gastroesophageal reflux. And if you ever want to study a subject, like if you go to my YouTube channel, just where there's a search option, just type in, let's say if you're interested in diabetes, type in diabetes, hypertension, hypertension, cancer, cancer, whatever. That's a good way to find stuff because otherwise, you know, there's a lot of videos and it can be hard to find whatever you're uh, looking for. Um, dementia, I got lots of lectures on that. So that's what I do. I haven't made playlists. I ought to learn how to do that, but I haven't uh, done that yet. Um, you know, I really don't have a lot of time for this. Like, this is just a fun thing that I enjoy. So I get a free moment. I crank these videos out, but I haven't really, it's just a hobby. I haven't really developed the site as well as it could be. I mean, I'm just trying to make it a good, helpful thing for people. Um, let's see what else was interesting. Oh, that cancers can shed a lot of cells into the blood. A, a one centimeter diameter cancer could shed as many as a million cancer cells in the blood in one day. So what does that mean? Well, to me, that means something big. It means that your immune system has to be functioning. I think everybody, every single person on this planet, every adult, you know, middle aged and older, at least certainly has some cancer cells in their body and our immune system handles them pretty easily. Um, and that totally makes sense. So that's why 
you want your immune system to work well. And all these things that optimize overall health tend to optimize immune system function. So here's the article, the reference um, I got from reading this book on um, cell shedding uh, into the blood with, uh, let's say, mammary adenocarcinoma. That was in rodents. Um, in 2020 in the United States, they figure about 33,000 men will die from prostate cancer. That's a lot. I remember T. Colin Campbell talking about uh, prostate cancer in um, Japan. And there was about 18 men in the entire country died in one uh, year, next to nothing. So, and that's back when the Japanese were eating, you know, their 80% or more of their calories from rice, but they still smoked a lot and had a lot of sodium. So I think that high animal protein, high fat in the diet are major, major, major contributors to uh, cancer progression. And T. Colin Campbell says, by far, the most important thing that causes progression of cancer is eating meat and dairy. Um, it's interesting how we talked about dairy. The dairy, you're screwed in multiple ways. You got tons of animal protein, even if you drink skim milk. And then you also got a lot of calcium. And when you have all that dietary calcium from the milk, that will inhibit the activation of vitamin D to the vitamin D3 form, which helps prevent cancer. So um, there's a good reason why skim milk is associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. And there's a good reason why you would think that milk will potentially increase the risk of many other cancers as a tum be a tumor promoter. Um, elevated blood cholesterol is associated with increased cancer risk. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. And that could also just be because animal protein increases blood cholesterol. Excess dietary fat increases blood cholesterol. Um, elevated dietary animal protein. Okay, that was the same point. Hyperinsulinemia. We talked about that a moment ago, how that's associated with increased insulin-like growth factor and it's mitogenic, causing mitosis in cells. Not good. Um, so I thought, you know, Milken was an interesting guy and he's, you know, he's a rich guy. He didn't have to do anything. He's trying to help the world. He's trying to be nice by donating money to a prostate cancer foundation. You know, I wonder how much useful research they're really doing. I kind of felt they were a little more reductionist focused than I would have liked. It kind of reminded me of Michael J. Fox funding all this, um, research into, um, Parkinson's disease. And what happens is, you know, these guys are brilliant in their own fields, but they're not scientists. And so that the reductionist types take over because the reductionist approach to science is what you get paid for to do in a university. But the great discoveries like, you know, T. Colin Campbell on animal protein, he did a component of reductionist work, but he primarily did the big epidemiology stuff with China. And um, that's the big sort of breakthrough observations. And what I'm saying is, you need that big holistic perspective from what I've seen to really get great improvements. Reductionism, how often does that ever lead to anything? It almost traps you into a cycle of thinking where you really can't achieve much is what I've seen. Because um, they also, you know, they say it right here on this page 467, cancer is primarily a genetic disease. What can you do with cancer as a genetic disease? You can't change your genes. When you say it's genetic, you're, you're, there's a tendency to push towards, well, you got to just take this drug rather than thinking through it's a metabolic problem. What causes metabolic abnormalities? I've seen a lot more promise come out of that. Like I said, there's only uh, just like two paragraphs on the Warburg effect. That should have been like a major part of any book on nutrition. And then I didn't see anything from my reading of it on all these issues of blood viscosity, capillary basement membrane thickening, tissue oxygenation. Those are things that I think are tremendously important from my reading of uh, literature of cancer physiology, pathophysiology. Um, and of course, we know those things that, you know, other sources have said can be helpful. We've talked about that in other lectures. You know, the whole food plant-based diet, low salt, low caffeine, get sleep, get sunshine to get vitamin D, et cetera, and exercise a lot to get the lymphatic blood flowing and other things that lower psychological stress. So anyways, I'm going through a whole bunch of books on cancer biochemistry, trying to understand it better. I just thought some of these things might be a little helpful. Hope so.